Good evening, dear mm -hmm. students of uh, third year simultaneous uh, translation. Uh, today I'm going to give you uh, a review uh, of uh, the major incidents uh, discussed so far in the course of uh, our discussion of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. And then we are going to complete our discussion uh, with uh, stave number three, uh, inshallah. Uh, seven years to the day after the death of his partner, Jacob Molly, a cold-hearted old businessman named Ebenezer Scrooge sits in his counting house. It is Christmas Eve. The year is sometime in the mid-1800s, and the place is London. This is, of course, uh, the sitting of the entire uh, novel. The day is bitterly cold and foggy. The inside of the office is cold as well, warmed only by two small fires. Bob Cratchit, Scrooge's humble clerk, low-paid clerk, is copying letters as Fred, Scrooge's nephew, comes in to wish his uncle a Merry Christmas. Scrooge berates the holiday describes the holiday this evening as humbug and rudely turns down Fred's invitation to dinner the next day. Then two gentlemen visit the office asking for donations for the poor. Scrooge rants and raves in response. He turns very angry, giving them nothing. <laughs> he said that he wants only to be left alone and that poor people belong in prisons and workhouses. They should go to prisons and workhouses. In contrast, out on the cold streets, shop windows are brightly decorated and people are happily preparing to celebrate the holiday of Christmas. Sometime after the gentlemen are sent on their way, are expelled, are turned away by Scrooge, of course. He scolds his clerk for expecting to be off on, on Christmas Day. He blames him for expecting to, to have a kind of vacation or a kind of holiday for some time. At the work day finally ends, Bob Cratchit hurries home to his, fam ham to his family and Scrooge dines alone in a nearby tavern, a nearby inn. As he unlocks the door of his gloomy building, he goes home, of course, after dining in that place. As he unlocks the door, open the door of, of this gloomy building where he dwells or lives, Scrooge is surprised to see Mala's face on the door knocker. Mala's face, okay, it's uh, a ghost. The beginning of his acquaintance with this ghost. Startled, but passing it off as a trick of the imagination. He tells him th himself that it is a mere thing of made, made by his imagination, not real. Scrooge enters his room and prepares for bed, but again he is startled, surprised, this time to hear the sound of a heavy chain dragging up the, the stairs, okay, going up, someone is going up and he is dragging, or whatever it is, is dragging up chains, and then he is so startled again to see Marley's ghost, a transparent but recognizable spirit, standing in front of him. Marley tells Scrooge that the chain of padlocks, ledgers, and cash boxes, as he tells him, he carries, okay, is his punishment, is a kind of punishment for living a selfish, money-obsessed life. He warns Scrooge that his fate will be as his own, as well, okay, 
unless he changes his life, unless Scrooge, unless Scrooge changes his life. Before disappearing out of the window, Marley's ghost tells Scrooge to expect a visit from three spirits, from three ghosts. At the stroke of one o'clock, Scrooge is visited by the ghost of the Christmas past. The first ghost is called the ghost of the Christmas past. Terrified, okay, he gets terrified. Scrooge is led by the gentle, childlike spirit. So the description of this spirit is that he is gentle and childlike. He takes him on a spirit, sorry, on a journey, backward in time and space as well. First, they visit the school Scrooge attended as a young boy. There they see young Ebenezer alone in his room after the other students have gone home for the holidays. Scrooge is touched and saddened to remember the loneliness of his childhood. At this time, the boy's only companions were the imaginary characters from his story books, not real persons from real life. Moving forward in time, the spirit shows Scrooge a slightly older Benson. Okay, he gets older in time, of course. This man, this young boy, this young man, okay, has again been left alone at the same school while the other boys are celebrating with their families. In this scene, however, Scrooge's sister Fan, called Fan, arrives to bring the sad boy home in a coach. In the next scene, Scrooge is a young man. Okay, he gets more and more older young man now and becomes an apprentice at the shop of old Fiswig, his master at this shop, his kindly employer. He was so kind. A jolly Christmas party is shown, okay? A happy Christmas party is being prepared for. At the end, of course, at the end of this Christmas Eve, Okay. At the end of this work day, this long work day, when the Fiswigs, the family of Mr. Fiswig, when the Fiswigs entertain not only their own employees, okay, but the neighborhood, the entire neighborhood comes in, okay, to celebrate as well. All the Scrooge is a thrilled, very happy to see himself happy at this moment and young again and to remember Fizzwig's generosity. Of course, the ghost tries to remind him of this man's generosity. Okay. Finally, the spirit shows Billy. Uh, it is, of course, uh, this Billy, this character, she is young Scrooge's sweetheart. She was the beloved woman of Scrooge when he was a young man at the time. He shows him Billy breaking their engagement because of his increasing preoccupation with money. Uh, let's now move uh, to uh, stave number three uh, in, in the second of the three spirits. In this uh, chapter, we have uh, an introduction to uh, the second ghost called the Ghost of a Christmas uh, Present. Uh, let's read together on page number 61. As you know, we are picking uh, up some uh, important quotations for discussion. Uh, on page number 61, uh, the first paragraph on this page, almost at the middle, middle section, the moment Scrooge's hand was on the lock. Uh, at this moment of, uh, uh, of this novel, uh, Scrooge begins to hear some sounds in the 
room next to him. Uh, and so he goes out to uh, look out uh, what's going on. The moment Scrooge's hand was on the lock of that door, his strange voice called him by his name and bade him enter. He obeyed. He entered that room. It was his own room. But, okay, not in the past, it is in the present. There was no doubt about that, but it had undergone a surprising transformation. This room had undergone a surprising transformation, a change. So here in this section, this paragraph, we have a, a full description of this room. The walls and the ceiling were so hung, were so filled with living green. It was full in the green color that it looked a perfect groove. A groove is a small wooded area from every part of which bright gleaming berries the kind of fruit glistened sparkled okay so we have fruits sparkling the crisp leaves the lovely leaves of holly a, a holly is an evergreen plant okay a holly is an evergreen plant Mistletoe, a green plant too. And ivy, the ivy is of course a kind of a climbing tree, climbing tree or plant, reflected back the light. So we have the green back backdrop of this ghost. As if so many little matters had been scattered there, reflecting this green light everywhere. And such a mighty blaze, such a huge glowing light, okay, roaring up the chimney. And that dull petrification, the word petrification means fossilization, turning into rocks, okay. And that dull petrification of the hearth, of the fireplace, had never known in Scrooge's time, or oh, Malus, his past friend, or for many and many a winter season gun, heaped up on the next page, turn over, 62, heaped up on the floor to form a kind of a throne, a throne in which this ghost is settled. Uh, later on, a couple of lines later, uh, almost the eighth line, okay, on this page, 62, eighth line, we have a, a full description of the ghost of a Christmas present. Let's begin by, in easy state, okay, the eighth line, in easy state upon this couch, okay, this throne, there sat a jolly giant so the giant this ghost is characterized by or as being uh, merry cheerful happy and giant huge in size glorious to see who bore a glowing torch okay there was there was a glowing torch in his hand in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, uh, so, sorry, Plenty's horn. Of course, Plenty's horn is a Latin symbol of, you know, of uh, nourishment. Okay, the word Plenty's horn is uh, a Latin word which symbolizes. Uh, nourishment and held it up okay high up 
to shed its light on Scrooge. Okay, as he came peeping round the door. Come in, exclaimed the ghost. Come in and know me better, man. Scrooge entered timidly, you know, shyly, okay, and hung his head before this spirit, this ghost. He, was, he wasn't the dogged Scrooge he had been, okay? He wasn't the determined Scrooge he had been. And though the spirit's eyes were clear and kind, okay, he didn't like to meet them. He didn't have an eye contact with that uh, ghost. Frankly telling him that I am the ghost of a Christmas present to the spirit. Look upon me. Scrooge reverently did so, respectfully, with much respect, did so. It was clothed in one simple green robe. It put on, this ghost put on one green robe or mantle. A mantle is a sleeveless cloak, is a sleeveless cloak or a sleeveless attire, bordered, surrounded by, bordered with white fur. Okay. This garment hung so loosely on the figure, on this ghost, that its capacious breast, that its spacious, roomy breast, Okay, was bare, as if disdaining to be warded, as if he didn't like to be warded, to be guarded or covered by something, by some kind of cloth, are concealed by any artifice, an artifice made by human beings. Its feet, and as I told you a moment ago, this is a full description of the ghost. Before that, we had a full description of the room, okay? And then moving on to a full description of this ghost. Uh, its feet observable beneath the ample folds of the garment, the many folds of the garment, that attire, were also bare. His feet were bare. And its head, it wore no other covering than a holly wreath. A holly crown on his head. So a holly crown in his head and a torch, a glowing torch in his hand. Sit here and there with shining icicles. Okay, I see droplets. I see droplets. It's dark brown curls. His hair was curled, dark and brown, were long and free free as its genial face, as its happy face, its unconstrained demeanor, free, okay, uh, behavior, and its joyful ear, its joyful appearance. So the most important thing about this ghost is that it is jolly or merry, okay, uh, respectful, okay, uh, that can easily gain your reverence. Girded around its middle, encircled, its middle section was encircled by, was an antique scabbard. Okay. But no sword was in it. You know, the scabbard is the sheath for the blade of a sword. The scabbard is the sheath for the blade of a sword, in Sami al Ghamd. But no sword was in it, it was empty. And the ancient teeth was eaten up with rust. So, this is the description, as I told you, uh, of the ghost's appearance. Then move on to uh, page. Number 66, we have uh, a sequel to the description of this ghost, uh, a certain feature in his appearance or in uh, the stuff he, ca he, he carries around. 
uh, the first paragraph on page number 66. But soon the steepless, you know, the steepless are the ornamental structures over churches. The ornamental structures over churches, which we call in our Islamic culture, those structures, long towers on mosques, uh, al midana okay? Steeples call people all to come to church and chapel, and away they came, everyone from every inch, flocking through, through the streets in their best clothes, and with the gayest faces, happy faces, and at the same time, there emerged from scores of by streets, from many side streets, lanes, and nameless turnings, innumerable people, many people, carrying their dinners to the baker's shops. Everyone is having celebrations, going to celebrate in the church. The sight of these poor revelers, seeing these celebrators, revelers means celebrators, appeared to interest the spirit, the ghost. He was very happy to see them going to have a celebration very much for he stood with scrooge beside him in a baker's doorway and taking off the covers as their bearers passed because you know uh, they are invisible to uh, everyone in this place sprinkled he the ghost sprinkled or sprayed incense on their dinners from his torch so he used his torch this torch uh, has the ability to sprinkle incense. What is incense? Pleasant uh, smell or a pleasant perfume. Okay. So he distributed his blessings, this kind of his beautiful or a pleasant smell perfume. Okay. Uh, on uh, on their dinners, okay, and it was a very uncommon kind of torch. For once or twice, when they were angry words between some dinner carriers, in case uh, there there is some kind of a quarrel or conflict or uh, an exchange of uh, words between angry bypassers these uh, celebrators in case there's any kind of quarrel okay he used the same torch okay who had jostled each other who has pushed each other on the way to the church he shed a few drops of water on them from it okay so it it is used to shed some a kind of pleasant smell pleasant perfume and uh, on the other hand, he's used to, uh, to shed few drops of water on these people, okay? And their good humor was restored directly. And when he does this, the conflict is over. The quarrels between the, those revelers or uh, celebrators uh, is all over. For they said it was a shame to quarrel upon Christmas Day this excuse and so it was god love god love it so it was uh, on page number 67 we have a kind of criticism made by this ghost uh, upon all humanity okay uh, almost the uh, the middle of this page page 67 there are some beginning with there are some upon this earth of yours. He's talking, of course, to Scrooge, directing kind of harsh criticism to humanity. There are some people among you who lay claim to know us, who reproach, he means that, people of earth reproaching or blaming ghosts. And who do their deeds of passion, pride, OK, 
okay and here uh, pride is used uh, in its negative meaning khuyala okay ill will hatred envy bigotry negative descriptions okay negative qualities of human beings bigotry and selfishness in our name who are as strange to us and all our kith and kin who are the kith and kin relatives and friends this idiomatic expression means uh, uh, relatives and friends as if they had never lived remember that and child the doings of themselves not us and so he accuses peoples of earth okay uh, of these negative qualities Uh, let's then move uh, to the next page, page 68. We have a, a very important scene at uh, Bob Cratchit's house. We have uh, a depth uh, view of uh, the life of this uh, man. Of course, you know that Bob Cratchit is the low paid clerk of Scrooge. We have an insight into his, his life. Uh, the first paragraph, beginning with, and perhaps it was, on page number 68, and perhaps it was a pleasure to good, the good spirit had in showing off this part of his, or else it was his own kind, generous, hearty nature, and his sympathy with all poor men that led him straight to, okay, Underline this part, please. That led him straight to Scrooge's clerks. His place, his abode, his house, the house of his clerk. For there he went and took Scrooge with him, holding to his rub. And on the threshold of the door, the spirit smiled and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with the sprinkling of the torch, just as he did uh, moments ago. Think of that, Bob had but 15 Bob a week himself. He pocketed on Saturdays but 15 copies of his Christian name. He was paid only 15 shillings. Okay, And yet the ghost of Christmas prison blessed his four-roomed house. So his house consists of only four rooms. Then up rose Mrs. Cratchit, his wife. Cratchit's wife dressed out, but poorly, awfully, in a twice-turned gown, in a gown that is made over twice. A gown that has been made over twice but brave. His, her gown was brave. Of course, the word brave means here in this context. It has another meaning. Of course, it means handsome, beautiful. A ribbons, decorated stripes, decorations, which are cheap and make a goodly show for sixpence. It worth only was sixpence. And she laid the cloth Okay. Assisted by Belinda Cratchit. Belinda is one of uh, Bob Cratchit's uh, siblings, one of his daughters. Second of her daughters. She is the second of his daughters, younger to another uh, daughter of Cratchit. But she doesn't exist in the, uh, at this moment because, you know, uh, she works. Okay, she has a kind of work. She works for uh, a mistress as a servant in her house. Second of her daughters, also brave ribbons, very beautiful ribbons. While Master Peter Cratchit, one of his uh, boys, okay, plunked a fork into the saucepan, into the saucepan of potatoes. 
and getting the corners of his monstrous shirt cooler, which is, in brackets, Bob's private property. So his father gave him his, his shirt, okay, which is too large for his, his, his kid, okay. Bob's private property conferred upon his son, given to his son by himself, and ear in order of the day. So he wanted to make his son uh, happy, okay, and give him uh, his shirt uh, into his mouth. Rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired, so smartly. He was so happy that he put on that, that uh, shirt and became so happy. And yearned to show his linen, okay, he longed to show his attire in the fashionable parks. He wanted to go outside and show the people what he was wearing. Okay. Uh, of course, this scene gives you an insight into how did this family felt during Christmas, okay, despite their poorly conditions. Okay. And now, two smaller crutches, another, okay, another two siblings of uh, Cratchit, two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, number three and four, came tearing in, dashing in, screaming that outside the bakers they had smelt the goose. They are cooking something, okay? They are cooking inside the house, of course, a goose as a feast. Of the celebration and known it for their own and basking in okay enjoying luxurious thoughts of saying an onion these young crutches danced about the table around the table and exalted master peter cratchit praised okay praised master peter cratchit to the skies okay uh, while he not proud, although his colors nearly chugged him, made him suffocate. His color made him suffocate. Okay. Blew the fire. He prepared the fire uh, in preparation of this feast to cook this goose. And to the slow potatoes bubbling up, forming bubbles, boiling in water, knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be lit out and peeled. It is now uh, fully cooked and needs peeling. On page number 69 we are. What has ever got your precious father then? Said Miss Cratchit and your brother Tiny Tim. Here we have a mention of this. This is a very important character in this novel. Tiny Tim, number five of the children. Tiny Tim, and Martha wasn't as late late uh, last Christmas Day by half an hour. Martha is the sixth one. They have six children. The older daughter of the family is Martha, who is now away working. She didn't come home. Okay. Here is Martha. Martha is coming, mother said the girl, appearing as she spoke. Martha is going home. She has come. Here is Martha, mother, cried the two young Cratchits. Hurrah! It's an expression of happiness. There is such a goose, Martha. Why, bless your heart alive, my dear. How late you are, said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times. Okay. She asked us why, why is she so late? And taking off her shawl and bonnet, the bonnet is a hat, okay, tied to the chin, okay, with a string, for her with officious zeal, with self-important enthusiasm, she took off this hat. We did a deal of work to finish up last night. Martha said that they were busy finishing up some kind of work, okay, at her mistress' house, replied the girl, and had to clear away this morning, mother. Well, never mind, so long as you are come, said Miss Cratchit. Sit you down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm Lord bless you. 
No, no, there is father coming. They are so attached to the father. Cried the two young creatures who were everywhere at once. Hide, Martha, hide. They're trying to play some game. So Martha hid herself in preparation for the game. She had herself. And in came little Bob, Bob Cratchit, the father, with at least three feet of comforter. A comforter is a quilt or a cover, three feet in length, okay? Exclusive of the fringe. Strip of hanging thread. A fringe is a strip of hanging threads. Hanging down before him and his threadbare clothes, his worn out clothes, done it up. Okay? Done it up means repaired with sewing stitches. Done it up means repaired with sewing stitches. يعني مرقعه بلغتنا العامية and brushed to look seasonable to look suitable for the season for this time of year and tiny Tom upon his shoulder carried upon his father's shoulders Alice for tiny Tom this is a description of tiny Tom pay attention to this description of tiny Tom Alice for tiny Tom he bought a little crutch, okay? In his hand was a long stick to walk on. He was crippled. He was a cripple, okay? And tiny in size, tiny tum, tiny in size. And had his limbs supported by an iron frame. He's a cripple, as I said. His limbs supported by an iron frame. Then move on to page number uh, 73. On page number 73, we have a sequel, Tatimma or uh, Takmila. Okay, we have a sequel to the description of this tiny tum on page number 73. Let's begin by, he sat very close. He sat very close to his father's side upon his little stool. Bob held his withered little hand. Withered means shriveled, dried up and dead because he is crippled. As if he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side. So this tiny Tim was very lovable by not only the father, but the entire family. Uh, and dreaded that he might be taken from him, might be dead one day, soon. Spirit, says Scrooge, with an interest he had never felt before towards such people, towards such poor, okay, people tell me if tiny tim will live he wants to have a glimpse of the future i see a vacant seat replied the ghost this vacant seat of course belongs to uh, tiny tim and the poor chimney corner and a crutch his crutch tiny tim's crutch without an owner without its owner Okay, carefully preserved by the family, of course. Okay, so he has a glimpse of the future, foreshadowing, kind of foreshadowing. Okay, and insight into the future in which there is no tiny term, his clutch preserved as it is by the family, which refers to how much they love him. If these shadows, if these glimpses remain unaltered, unchanged, if these conditions Charles Dickens means, if the conditions of the poor remain at this, okay, 
by the future, the child will die. So he means, Charles Dickens, the future generation will suffer a lot. No, no, says Scrooge, oh, no, no, kind spirit, say he will be spared, he will be saved. If these shadows remain unaltered again, unaltered by the future, none other of my race, his race of ghosts, return the ghost, will find him here. No other ghost in the near future, which might come to you visiting, okay, will, will be found. It will be not, uh, uh, Tiny Tim will be not found. Well then, if he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. How could the death of Tiny Tim, this little poor boy, crippled as he is, how could his death be a better thing? And when he says to decrease the surplus population, we have a kind of sarcasm. Okay, sarcasm, which reminds us of the same words said by Scrooge at the beginning of this novel. Here, the ghost reproaches the logic used by uh, Scrooge at the beginning. Scrooge hung his head to hear his own words quoted. He said that before by the spirit and was overcome with penitence, with sorrow and grief, he felt regret, okay? He regretted what he has said before against poor people. Man, listen to this very carefully, very carefully because it is an, uh, an address not only to Scrooge but to the entire humanity. Man, says Scrooge, said the ghost, if man you be in heart, if you are truly Human from within, from inside, not adamant. It means unable to be changed. If there is a hope that you can change one day, listen, forbear the wicked can't, stop the wicked hypocrisy until you have discovered what the surplus is and where, okay, the surplus is not located, doesn't exist in these poor slums, in these poor places dwelled by these people. No, the surplus isn't here. Well, you decide what men shall live, sorry, what men shall live, what men shall die, it may be, okay? Can you decide who is going to die and who is not, who are supposed to die and who are not. It may be that in the, in the sight of heaven, you are more worthless. In the sight of heaven, in the eyes of God, okay? You are no more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this, page 74, than millions like this poor man's child. He doesn't deserve to live any longer, okay, than this poor child. You are worthless if you see this, this child as a worthless human being. You are more worthless than this. Oh God, to hear the insect on the leaf, and here we have a very beautiful metaphor used by Charles Dickens, on page number 74, at the top of the page, we have a great metaphor. To so hear the insect on the leaf, okay, an insect may be a worm on a leaf, okay, one of the leaves of a tree, pronouncing on, stating opinion, this insect stating an opinion. Okay, giving a decision, releasing a judgment, judging other people, uh, pronouncing on the too much life among his hungry brothers, pronouncing his judgment on his hungry brothers who are not on a leaf, okay, 
but in the dust. Not on a tree, but on the ground, in the dust. Here we have a metaphor in which the writer likens, Charles Dickens likens Mushabbe, the Scrooge, to an insect on a leaf, on too much food for an insect, okay? And is compared in this condition, okay, to his hungry brothers, poor people of the same place, of London, okay, other insects, but who are, of course, people, okay, these insects that are very poor in the dust. The dust here means who are suffering hunger, okay, so the leaf is a symbol of food and, and the dust is a symbol of hunger. Uh, thank you and see you next time, inshallah, in another lecture.